So, uh, in this module, we will look at uh, compressible flow through nozzles. Uh, now, compressible flows are encountered in many applications, uh, mostly in aerospace and mechanical engineering. For example, flow through nozzles, uh, flow through turbo machinery blade passages such as uh, compressors or turbines uh, and diffusers and uh, compressible flow is also encountered in external aerodynamics like for example flow over uh, an airfoil or aircraft wing and so on, flow around aircraft and also flow through rocket engines. So, these are all uh, examples of uh, compressible flows in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Of course, for um, uh, aerospace engineers, the working substance is always uh, air, but for mechanical engineers, the working substance is not only air, but also steam because uh, mechanical engineers have to typically work with uh, steam turbines and steam nozzles. So, uh, steam is a working substance that mechanical engineers encounter quite uh, frequently. In addition, uh, gas dynamics of refrigerants is also important because um, uh, as I had mentioned, um, uh, earlier, um, uh, in, in domestic refrigerators, capillary tubes are used as, um, as a throttling valve. Okay. And um, so, the gas dynamics of flow in the capillary tubes is very important uh, in the design of such vapor compression refrigeration systems. So, mechanical engineers will encounter air, steam as well as uh, as well as a refrigerant as working substance, whereas uh, aerospace engineers will encounter only air as the working substance. Okay. And um, the, the scope uh, of, um, our, of the lecture in this module will be confined to uh, flow through nozzles, okay, because uh, flow through, uh, as I said, turbo machinery blade passages or um, flow through nozzles or diffusers uh, all uh, can be categorized into a simple uh, quasi one dimensional flow category. Okay. Now, of course, detailed calculations can be made, but uh, once we learn uh, quasi one dimensional flows or rather uh, flow through uh, varying area passages, then we would be able to apply this to most of the applications that we have in mind for a first cut analysis, which is usually very, uh, very adequate. Okay. So, that is what we are going to do. So, our uh, uh, scope is to look at a flow through uh, nozzles or uh, passages of uh, uh, varying area of cross section. Okay? Now, so we will learn whatever is required to achieve this objective. Okay? So, in the if uh, air is the working substance, then we would um, uh, look at uh, normal shocks because normal shocks are encountered in, uh, in nozzles, whereas we will not uh, really do normal shocks with uh, steam as the working substance because it is a highly non-equilibrium phenomenon and well uh, outside the scope of this work. Okay. So, we will look at the basics ir, uh, you know, irrespective of the working substance, then we will develop the theory of no normal shocks which is applicable for air and then we will look at flow of uh, air as well as steam through nozzles. Okay. We will not really look at any particular application of uh, uh, involving refrigerants, but the theory is uh, very straightforward. So, we will develop the theory both for a calorically perfect gas such as air as well as uh, a substance like steam, which is far from being calorically perfect. Let us uh, first uh, introduce, formally introduce the notion of compressibility. Okay? So, compressibility of a fluid is defined as minus 1 over V partial V partial P, where V is the specific volume or if you, you write it in terms of density, we may write it as 1 over rho partial rho partial P. Okay. The negative sign in the front here uh, ensures that the compressibility is a positive quantity. Okay. Now, the value of the compressibility will depend on how this is done. For example, um, any change in specific volume due to a change in pressure can be accomplished in many different ways. For example, uh, let us say I have a piston cylinder mechanism and I have some uh, comp uh, compressible substance inside, let us say air. Okay. Now, when I compress this substance, there is a change in specific volume as a result of a change in pressure. Okay. But the magnitude of the change in specific volume due to the change in pressure will depend on whether the process takes place isothermally or whether the process takes place adiabatically or something else. Okay. So, the process is also important. Okay, so, based on that, we may have something like an isentropic uh, compressibility or isothermal compressibility and so on. 
Now, let us take a, a slightly broader look on, um, on this notion. We know that uh, specific volume V is a function of two properties. The two property rule applies in this case. There are uh, no other uh, means or modes of energy storage. So, the two property rule applies and I may write uh, the expression for a change in uh, specific volume due to uh, a change in pressure as well as a change in temperature. So, when specific volume of a compressible substance changes by a certain amount, let us say dV, okay, part of it is due to a change in pressure, part of it is due to change in temperature. That is what each one of this term here represents. Okay. Notice that because it is a function of two variables, when you take the partial derivative, automatically this quantity is evaluated at constant temperature and this quantity is evaluated at constant pressure. Okay. The first term here may be identified as compressibility as we just defined it. So, any change in specific volume due to a change in pressure alone is called uh, compressibility. Remember, here it is due to a change in pressure alone because temperature is being kept constant. Okay. Now, here uh, any change in specific volume due to a change in temperature alone, remember P is being held constant, is simply volumetric expansion. So, we have uh, let us say uh, you know uh, air in a vessel or a room and we add heat. So, we heat the air, then the uh, air expands as a result of heating, it becomes lighter and the lighter air uh, will go up because the air is undergoing uh, volumetric expansion. So, that is what this term signifies. Okay? Change in specific volume due to a change in temperature alone. Okay? Now, notice that any change in specific volume due to a change in uh, temperature alone is not an indication of compressibility that is simply an exp uh, that is simply an indication of uh, volumetric expansion any change in specific volume due to a change in pressure alone is considered to be uh, an indication of compressibility so uh, when you have a flow and you start talking about compressible flow there will be changes in density or specific volume Okay. Now, the change in density or specific volume due to the uh, due to a change in pressure alone is considered to be an indication of compressibility. So, that is why we are starting with the notion of compressibility because that will naturally lead to compressible flow where compressibility effects are presumably uh, significant. Okay. So, in a compressible flow, where compressibility effects are uh, significant, uh, changes in specific volume would be largely due to change in pressure. There could be a change in specific volume due to change in temperature also, but it will be largely due to change in pressure. Okay? All right. Now, the isothermal compressibility of uh, water is 5 times 10 raised to minus 10 and the uh, isothermal compressibility of air at uh, both are 298 Kelvin. Um, for air it is 10 raised to minus 5. So, it is uh, clear that the uh, isothermal compressibility of air is 5 orders of magnitude more than that of water, not 5 times but 5 orders of magnitude more than that of water. So, what are we to infer from this? Does this mean that uh, any flow of air uh, should be considered compressible? Will compressibility effects be dominant in such a flow? For example, I may look at uh, flow of air over an automobile. I may be looking at flow of air over an airfoil or a wing. I may be looking at flow of air in a nozzle or flow of air in a turbo machinery blade passage. Uh, do we classify all these flows as compressible because the uh, isothermal compressibility of air is so high. Remember, this is isothermal compressibility of air. So, this is isothermal compressibility of air. So, because it is so high, do we uh, classify all this as compressible flows? So, we need I mean, it would be helpful to have a criterion by which we can actually make this sort of determination. 
based on some expectations of, of what we are going to see uh, in the flow. We have some ideas about uh, the flow field. So, based on that we should uh, it would be helpful to have some criterion which would tell us whether compressibility effects are significant in this flow field or not. So, what we are the distinction that we are trying to make here is this ok. The fluid itself see it is clear from this that water is incompressible no question about it ok. But it is clear that air is compressible. So, what we are trying to uh, distinguish here is a compressible fluid versus compressible flow. The question is if the fluid is compressible uh, is the flow of such a fluid always uh, compressible or is compressible flow slightly different or somewhat different from a compressible fluid or can we possibly have flow of a compressible fluid in which compressibility effects are not significant ok. That is the distinction that we are trying to make here. Okay. Now, you all know from your high school physics that uh, sound which is nothing but um, uh, propagation of pressure waves in any medium. So, sound travels in any medium with the speed which depends on the bulk compressibility. The less compressible the medium, the higher the speed of sound. For example, speed of sound in air, if you go back to the same example as before, speed of sound in air is at room temperature is 330 meter per second. Speed of sound in water at this temperature is of the order of about 1 to 1.2 kilometer per second. So, you can see that it is about 4 uh, times higher in water than in uh, air. So, it depends on the bulk compressibility. So, speed of sound is a convenient reference speed when flow is involved. How? Let us say you know let us um, uh, revisit the examples that I mentioned flow over an automobile. Let us say the automobile is moving at 120 kilometer per hour which is fairly high speed as you would know ok. Now, uh, what we do is we uh, try to calculate the, uh, uh, the speed with reference to the speed of sound. So, when the automobile moves with uh, at such speed uh, let us say Let us say it, uh, the automobile is moving at a speed of uh, 120 kilometers per hour, uh, which would roughly um, uh, work out to about uh, 30 to 40, about 35 to 40 meter per second, roughly. Okay. Now, when I compare this with the speed of sound in air under these conditions, normal atmospheric conditions, it would be 330 meter per second. So, we can see that the maximum speed that we are likely to see in the uh, flow around this uh, vehicle, let us uh, let me just uh, draw this with a slightly uh, different color. So, we are trying to let us say look at uh, flow around this automobile, right. So, let us say this is the ground. Now, the maximum speed that we are going to that we are likely to see uh, in this flow field is going to be 40 meter per second, <coughs> which is considerably less than the speed of sound which is 330 meter per second. So, the speed of sound serves as a useful reference speed uh, in compressible flows. Okay. Compressibility effect becomes more pronounced as the flow speed becomes comparable to the speed of sound. Okay. Now, the flow speed in this case, remember uh, we will encounter a flow speed when we switch to a frame of reference where the automobile is stationary and the air is flowing around the automobile. Like for instance, uh, if the automobile were to be kept in a wind tunnel. Okay. So, in such cases when the flow speed, maximum flow speed is comparable to the speed of sound, then compressibility effects will be significant in the flow field, otherwise it will not be. Okay. So, a good reference for this uh, good reference speed uh, to categorize the flow or to, uh, to distinguish whether uh, compressibility effects are going to be significant or not is the speed of sound. Okay. Now, we uh, I also uh, gave some other examples like flow over an airfoil. So, the aircraft uh, may be flying at a speed of let us say uh, 800 to 900 kilometers per hour. 
which would easily work out to at a very high altitude where the temperature may be of the order of about uh, 220 or 230 uh, Kelvin, okay, 240 Kelvin, something like that, right. So, this is at an altitude of maybe 35,000 feet, okay. So, a uh, speed of about 800 kilometer per hour or 900 kilometer per hour would work out to a Mach number of roughly about 0.9 or so. So, compressibility, uh, compressibility effects would be very much significant. So, in the same manner, uh, we can make a determination whether compressibility effects are going to be substantial in the flow field in the blade passage of a compressor or a turbine by having an idea about the maximum speed that we are likely to encounter. It need not be accurate. We want to see whether um, the maximum speed is anywhere close to the speed of sound. Even if it is half of the speed of sound, we would then say that yes, probably compressibility effects may be, uh, may be significant. We will in fact give a number for doing this also, but you get the idea that you know as we get as a maximum speed in the, uh, in the flow field uh, keeps getting closer to uh, the speed of sound compressibility effects are significant. <coughs> so, basically uh, what we are going to do is to define a ratio called the Mach number, which is the, uh, the actual uh, speed in the flow field divided by uh, the speed of sound at any point. Okay. So, basically in a flow field speed of sound will vary from one uh, location to another depending on the temperature okay. and flow velocity will also vary from one point to another depending on the uh, flow field. Okay. So, the Mach number is actually a local quantity, but what we are doing is we are actually uh, using the Mach number sort of like a global quantity. We, we make a guess for example, in the case of the uh, flow over the automobile, we uh, make an educated guess that the velocity anywhere in the flow field is going to be less than 120 kilometer per second or 40 meter per second. So, the Mach number even for that case is going to be uh, less than 0.1 or 0.1 or so. And same in the same manner, we said the aircraft is flying at 900 kilometers per hour. So, the maximum speed is going to be uh, in that order of magnitude. So, for that the Mach number is 0.9. So, definitely compressibility effects will be uh, significant in this flow field. Okay. So, we are actually using a reference speed uh, to calculate the Mach number, but what you must keep in mind, we will come to this little bit later. What you must keep in mind is that the Mach number is not constant for an entire flow field. It varies from point to point. That is why we have emphasized it here, V is the velocity magnitude at any point or location and A is the speed of sound at that location. We can try to get, uh, you know, I, I mentioned just a, a little bit earlier that for Mach number 0.5, we can say, let us say give the benefit of the doubt and say that, you know, compressibility effects are probably going to be uh, significant or not insignificant. But at what value for Mach number would we say that compressibility effects are insignificant? Okay. It would be nice to have a number or a criterion, which is what we will try to work out based on some simple order of magnitude arguments. Okay. So, if you uh, uh, go back to this, uh, uh, this example, now as the streamline approaches the, uh, approaches the vehicle, if you look at the stagnation streamline, which would be this one. Right. So, the pressure at this point is the stagnation pressure. You know from Bernoulli's equation that the uh, uh, stagnation pressure, uh, dynamic pressure in this case is going to be uh, uh, rho times V ref square. Now, you may say that you know it is actually V ref square over 2 and so on, but that is not what we are interested in. We are interested in an order of magnitude estimate. Okay? Numerical factors like this unless they are very large do not make a difference to the order of magnitude analysis. Okay? If there is a coefficient in front which is like 10 or 100 or 1000, then we have to be concerned. If it is 1 or 2 or 3, we do not have to be concerned because we are doing order of magnitude, not factors of magnitude, order of magnitude. So, you can see that the pressure at the point that I indicated in the case of the automobile, this is where the pressure is going to be maximum and the maximum pressure is going to be roughly of this order. 
over the background atmospheric pressure. So, that, so remember we are talking about delta P that is change in pressure. So, the maximum change in pressure is going to be at the stagnant front stagnation point and the value of the change is going likely to be of the order of rho times V ref square. V ref here is a characteristic speed and we estimate it for the maximum value. What is the highest possible delta P? Which means we substitute 40 meter per second for V ref, right? Now, you also know from your high school physics that uh, uh, speed of sound is given by this expression square root of delta P over delta rho uh, with entropy remaining constant. Okay. So, if I take a, now I can take a quantity like delta rho over rho and write it like this delta over rho over rho equal to 1 over rho times delta rho over delta P times delta P, where I evaluate this quantity in an isentropic process. Right. Now, delta P itself is equal to rho times V ref square. And uh, this is equal to 1 over A square, where A is the speed of sound. So, we end up with this quantity. So, we end up with delta rho over rho as being approximately, remember this is an order of magnitude analysis. So, uh, we say that it is of the order of m square, where m is the Mach number based on the reference quantity, not at each point, we are calculating it at uh, for the reference value. Okay. So, basically notice that um, this quantity, so if you look at, so from our earlier expression of uh, delta rho or isentropic uh, compressibility, we may also write delta rho over rho as equal to tau s times delta p, which means that this is equal to tau s and which we knew already. Okay. So, speed of sound is thus related to compressibility, that is why we are actually using uh, speed of sound as the reference speed, because it is um, related to the bulk compressibility of the medium through this expression. <coughs> so, in fact, you can show that tau s is equal to, if you compare these two, you can show that tau, uh, tau s is equal to 1 over times 1 over a square. So, a is the speed of sound that is that is that so that so you have velocity there whereas tau s is compressibility. So, the speed of sound links tau s and uh, and compressibility, which is why uh, sound, propagation of sound in a medium is always or the speed of sound in a medium is an indication of its bulk compressibility. Okay, now, we are saying that delta rho over rho scales as m square. So, the guideline that we generally have for uh, accounting for or neglecting compressibility effect is to say that if the change in density is less than 10 percent of the mean value, which means I am sorry, which means this quantity delta rho over rho uh, is equal to about 0 0.1 or less. 10 percent is 0.1. So, if it is 0 0.1 or less, then we can generally uh, neglect compressibility effects. So, if uh, delta rho over rho is less than 0 0.1 equal to 0 0.1 or less, then that generally implies that m is uh, less than or equal to roughly 0 0.3, m is less than or equal to 0 0.3. So, compressibility effects as a guideline, we can say compressibility effects may be expected to be significant only when the Mach number exceeds 0 0.3. This is again just a guideline. Okay. And bear in mind that this is based on uh, general estimation. So, you may have a flow field, let us say where Mach number, uh, let us say we have flow over an airfoil or a wing or something like this. So, let us say m is equal to 0 0.3. So, it is quite possible that as the flow goes over the airfoil, there may be some locations in the uh, flow field where the Mach number is actually more than 0 0.3. 
that is quite likely. So, you have to uh, take this guideline value with uh, caution. Okay? You have to be very careful. You should have an idea about the flow field that you are looking at. If it is too close to 0.3, then it is certainly possible that there may be regions here where compressibility effects may be locally uh, be significant, but not everywhere. In that case, you have to treat the entire flow as compressible. Okay, because if it is if it is significant in some parts of the flow field, but not in other parts, in order to account for parts where it is significant, we have to treat the entire flow as compressible. Okay, so this is a the, the guideline value should not be used blindly. Okay, you need to have an idea about the flow field and then evaluate this criterion with respect to the flow field, and then judge whether the compressibility effects are significant in this flow field or not.